On October 4th, 2020, epidemiologists from Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford authored the Great Barrington Declaration. Because of grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of the prevailing COVID-19 policies, they argued that all COVID-19 lockdowns should end. Instead, we should adopt a strategy they call focus protection, which is aimed at protecting elderly and vulnerable populations while allowing everyone else to resume normal life. The proponents of focus protection say it's the most compassionate approach to minimize mortality and social harm until we reach herd immunity, which is the goal of all COVID-19 mitigation strategies. This is the saner approach, the more moral approach, the more scientifically based approach. Critics of the declaration issued a counter memorandum stating that any pandemic management strategy relying upon immunity from natural infections for COVID-19 is flawed. Uncontrolled transmission in younger people risks significant morbidity and mortality across the whole population. Should the coronavirus lockdowns be lifted and replaced with a targeted strategy that protects the old and other high-risk groups? That was the subject of an online Soho Forum debate on Sunday, December 13th. It featured Martin Kulldorff, a Harvard biostatistician and epidemiologist and co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, versus Andrew Neumer, an associate professor of population health and disease prevention at University of California, Irvine, who signed the so-called John Snow Memorandum written in response. Here's Martin Kulldorff and Andrew Neumer in an online debate moderated by SoHo Forum Director Gene Epstein. Martin, you're first up to defend the resolution. You have 17 and a half minutes. Uh, Jane, please close the initial vote and take it away, Martin. Thank you, Jean. Um, the way we have approached uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is the worst public health disaster ever. Uh, the lockdowns and contact tracing strategy that has been employed by most countries have led to many excess uh, unnecessary deaths, both from COVID-19 as well as from other health outcomes. Uh, and it's uh, very tragic and it's a tragedy on a worldwide scale. Uh, the failures can be split into two. One is we have failed to properly protect uh, the high risk older people among us, which have left to unnecessary deaths in COVID-19. Also, there has been enormous collateral damage from the lockdowns, as well as from the fear that's associated with uh, the, the lockdowns. And uh, uh, that has uh, caused a lot of damage for younger people. And uh, that's something that we are gonna have to live with and die with for many years to come, even if the lockdowns would end uh, tomorrow. Um, now, uh, among the professionals like uh, lawyers or journalists or, or scientists like me, uh, things have turned out quite okay. There has not been uh, as many, um, many deaths as much mortality among our group. On the other hand, these lockdowns and this strategy that we use for the pandemic has been the worst assault on the working class uh, in half a century in the United States, uh, the worst since segregation and the Vietnam War. So, uh, uh, and, and especially it has hurt uh, uh, urban working class uh, and the inner cities. So again, uh, very, very tragic, uh, but, uh, and, and, uh, and while it has affected everybody, it has uh, especially affected uh, the working class. So the question is, uh, what, really, what went wrong? What happened here? Uh, well, one thing that went wrong was that most Western countries had prepared uh, pandemic preparedness plans beforehand, before this year started. Uh, because we knew as epidemiologists that sooner or later there will be another pandemic. And after this one, there will be many more pandemics because that's part of uh, uh, human history. So we knew whatever were gonna come, but when COVID-19 came at the beginning of this year, 
uh, most countries threw these pandemic preparedness uh, out the window. And there were uh, four fundamental mistakes that we made uh, that we uh, ignored basic public health principles. One is that in public health, we cannot uh, look only at one disease, COVID-19. In public health, we always have to look at health as a whole. Um, so other diseases, general health. And uh, by looking at, by focusing on COVID-19 and ignoring other things and the collateral damage caused on other diseases, uh, we have uh, done a lot of disservice to public health and uh, thrown that, uh, that principle away. Uh, a second principle that we have ignored is in public health, one has to look at the long term and not the short term. Uh, if you're a cancer patient, you want to prolong life another six months or 12 months, you look at it short term because th that way uh, your grandmother or grandfather, if they can live another year, that's great for, for, for the family and can, they can spend more time with children and grandchildren and so on. But to postpone things in public health, to postpone uh, epidemic or pandemic, that just pushes the same problem into the future. So in, in, uh, in public health, we have to think of it long term, not short term. Uh, the third one is we have to look at the whole population and not only some parts of the population. Public health means health for everybody, uh, old and young, uh, rich and poor, uh, urban, rural, etc. And that has been uh, ignored during this uh, approach to this pandemic. And the fourth principle that we have thrown out the window is risk communication. And with that goes the trust between the population and public health officials, which has deteriorated enormously, uh, and which is gonna be a big problem for the future. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of each of these four uh, in turn. Before I do that, uh, there, there are things, we know more and more about COVID-19. Uh, there are still things we do not know, but one thing we knew all the, all the day from the very beginning, uh, from, from the winter and beginning of this year, is that there is an enormous difference in risk between ages. So while anybody can get infected by this disease, by COVID-19, and, and all ages do get infected, the risk for, for mortality is very different. So there's a th more than a thousandfold risk, a difference in risk between the oldest and the youngest. So for old people uh, in their 70s and 80s and 90s, and also somewhat in the 60s, uh, COVID-19 is a disease that's worse than uh, the annual influenza, the more serious, more dangerous. On the other hand, for children, this is not a serious disease. Um, uh, it's much less for children, there's much less risk uh, from COVID-19 than there is from uh, the annual influenza. Uh, and there are many other uh, uh, health issues that are much more serious for children. So uh, uh, that's something that we should have taken into account when we, uh, when we devise a strategy for how to deal with this disease. Uh, and we call that in what we wrote in October with two colleagues, the Great Barrington Declaration, where we advocate for focused protection, where we do a better job at protecting the high risk old people at the same time as we let younger people live lives more normally. They should still do general preventive measures like washing hands and staying home when sick, but they should be able to live normal lives to keep the society going to avoid all the collateral damage from the lockdowns uh, uh, because that's the highest risk factor for them. They are much, much higher risk from these uh, lockdowns than from, from COVID. Uh, and uh, so that's why we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration in October, which I did uh, together with uh, two colleagues. Uh, one is Dr. Snatter Gupta at Oxford University who uh, in my view is the preeminent infectious disease technologist in the world, as well as uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford University, who is an expert on uh, 
on infectious disease epidemiology and how, how public health policy affects the most vulnerable among us. So I want to go back a little bit to the uh, four principles. Uh, and we start then with uh, the fact that we cannot focus on one disease, we have to focus on, uh, on all health. So what has, uh, what are the collateral damage from, from these lockdowns? Well, uh, it has been devastating for children who have not been allowed, many who have not been allowed to go to schools. Um, and that's not only important for the education and, and uh, uh, it's also important for their physical health and their mental health and it's important for uh, social development. And uh, the effects are of course in, uh, in short term uh, right now, but also long term. If you lose one uh, year of education uh, of school, that has long term effects uh, uh, on uh, both uh, your general education as well as on long term health effects. At the same time, children are not at risk themselves. So they are, we are asking the children to sacrifice themselves uh, for something that uh, uh, even uh, has uh, uh, almost zero benefits. And you would say that, that, well, maybe there's very few children who got COVID-19 because there were no schools. So to look at that, what the effect is of school closings on children, we have to look at, if you want to be scientific about it, we have to look at the one Western country who, who did not close the schools during the height of the pandemic in the spring, and that was Sweden. So in Sweden, daycare and schools were open for all children ages one to 15 throughout the height of the pandemic, uh, when there was a lot of transmission in society. And among uh, among the 1.8 million children in Sweden uh, at this time, there were exactly zero COVID-19 deaths. So not a single child uh, died from COVID-19 in Sweden during this time, even though the schools were open. Uh, and this was done, there was no testing in the schools, no testing of the children. There were no masks used and there were no social distancing. Uh, if a child was sick, had a cough or a sneezing or, 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 or runny nose, they were asked to stay at home. And if they came to school, they were sent home. So, and there were also extra cleanings in the schools, but that was the preventive measures. And despite that, there were no a single uh, COVID-19 death. There were a few hospitalizations, but not a single death. And uh, if we look at the teachers, because they also, also in schools, the teacher had the same uh, COVID-19 risk as the average of other professions. So though they are not at excess risk because they, uh, they deal with children all, all day. And if we look at multi-generational homes, uh, if you were over 70, in which case you're at higher risk for COVID, you had a higher risk if you lived with working adults compared to uh, adults your own age. Uh, but if you also lived with children, that didn't decrease the risk any further. So older people in multi-generational homes, they are at excess risk, but not from children, but they are from the adults uh, living in, in the same home. Um, and we can also see for children, like uh, uh, the vaccination rates have plummeted uh, because of the lockdowns. And it has recovered a little bit, but not fully. And we have seen in some parts of the world that we have had, for example, measles outbreaks now. And there might be more to come, uh, most likely. Uh, there are other health outcomes that have been devastated by the, by the uh, lockdowns. Uh, either because uh, appointments are cancelled or because people are afraid to go to the hospitals. Uh, or they think the hospitals are full and so on. So, uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes has worsened, like heart attacks and strokes and so on. Uh, so that has led to many excess deaths. Um, we have also cancer. Uh, many, uh, there, there's fewer cancers this year. And uh, you would think that that would be a good thing because we don't like cancer. Five minutes, so, five minutes, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, and, and nobody's gonna die from, or very few people are gonna die from cancer this year because they don't have their screening, 
but uh, there are there are less cancers diagnosed, but there are still cancers there, but they're just detected later. So there is, uh, uh, and then you get the treatment later. So somebody maybe who didn't get the pap smear screening, uh, a woman might not die from cervical cancer three or four years from now instead of living 15 to 20 years more. So this is things that we're going to see in the future. There are also, of course, mental health, and there's uh, uh, and in the third world, in the developing world, uh, the consequence has been devastating with uh, children starving to death because of the lockdowns. And while the politicians are excused from not uh, uh, thinking about their own jurisdiction, I think as academics, as scientists, and public health scientists, we don't have that excuse. We have to also think about uh, the rest of the world and the enormous damage that happened in Africa, Asia, and Latin America because of the lockdowns there. Uh, one example of these uh, consequences of the lockdown is if we look at the, those who are 25 to 44 years old in, in the U.S., uh, among the deaths in the U.S. so far in this age group, about 4% have been due to COVID-19, but the excess mortality in this age group is 26%, according to a recent uh, CDC study published in uh, MMWR. Uh, so that sort of shows the effect of of the lockdowns on mortality in this age group. Uh, and we don't know as of yet exactly which, if it's cardiovascular or mental health issues like suicide or so on. We don't have those numbers yet, but we know it is enormous. Uh, so again, uh, uh, what, uh, even if these lockdowns ended tomorrow, if we get back to normal tomorrow, uh, uh, these are consequences of the of the strategy of the lockdown and contact strategy that has failed to prevent older people from uh, from dying from COVID-19. At the same time, has generated enormous damage uh, on other uh, disease outcomes, and we've only seen some of that so far. We're going to see much more of that in the years to come, and we will also know the numbers eventually. So it will be very clear now many of the numbers are not there, but we will eventually have the, the uh, health statistics to, uh, to be able to quantify that uh, in greater detail. So uh, thank you very much. That was my initial uh, remark. Okay. All right. Thank you. You came in under your allotment, uh, but uh, you know that um, we, don't, we don't trade allotments. Uh, Andrew Neumer speaking for the negative. Uh, Take it away, Andrew. Thank you very much, Gene. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone at the SoHo Forum for inviting me and for hosting this event. Thank you for the audience for, uh, for watching uh, both uh, live and uh, I assume this will be available on YouTube or something later on. So thank you for joining us and, and, and thank you to Martin for, uh, for agreeing to be uh, the opponent today. And uh, if you want to uh, see uh, what I feel about this ongoing epidemic as the crisis evolves. I'm on, uh, I'm active on Twitter. You can follow me or block me at Andrew Neumer. Uh, I have uh, no uh, financial conflicts of interest to report. Uh, so uh, a, a number of people in my profession discouraged me from uh, joining this debate today. Um, but I, I just want to say that uh, academic freedom and rational discourse is a, is a hill that I will die, that I'm willing to die on. So I, I think it's important for us to have an open exchange of ideas and to let the public, who are after all stakeholders in all of this, uh, see both sides of, of a debate. So even though I have very strong feelings uh, about the topic of the day, I'm, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to engage in some, with someone who uh, thinks otherwise. This, uh, this debate has become extremely polarized and most of you are probably tuning in uh, to, to watch two scientists sort of talk past one another and so that you can cheer on the, the decide that you have already um, made up your mind on. But I hope uh, nonetheless that you will engage with this material in an open uh, mind, and I hope, I hope that uh, I can persuade you if, if you voted in favor of the resolution to begin with. First of all, I, I don't think we should call these uh, measures that we're taking against the coronavirus pandemic as lockdowns. I think calling them lockdowns was a, 
horrendous blunder uh, from the get-go, and I have stopped using that word. I, I, I will refer to them as public health orders, and I hope I don't slip up and uh, re refer to them by any other name during the rest of this debate. But if I, if I do, um, it's just because that, that word has entered the public discourse so much. And uh, I, uh, I think public health orders are, are the, the way we should describe these, uh, these uh, what we're doing. Now, why are public health orders necessary, temporary public health orders necessary to combat COVID-19. There's a lot of misunderstanding in the public discourse about the risks of COVID-19. And my interlocutor referred, uh, in fact, to risk communication as being a, a key area. There has been a lot of debate from the early days of this pandemic of comparing COVID-19 mortality rates to those of influenza, which is a disease with which we're all familiar. So it's kind of a natural uh, milepost, a natural comparison. And I will concede that uh, the infection fatality rate for coronavirus is in the same ballpark as that of influenza. It is in fact a little bit higher. It's, a, it's about two or two and a half times higher uh, than that of flu, with the exception of children, in which, in which case flu has a much higher uh, infection fatality rate. Um, but fatality rates uh, by age often go with uh, logarithmic scale, so a, a two times uh, factor is actually sort of still in the same ballpark as flu. And so I will uh, readily concede that uh, the infection fatality rate of coronavirus is not a wholesale greater than flu, but there is a, a complete misunderstanding of that statistic as it applies to the risk it poses for us in the pandemic. And one of my greatest regrets is that it's not more widely understood that the IFR, the infection fatality rate, is not the key metric to understand this pandemic. And in, and in fact, some of the debates um, that have been emerging about, um, oh, you know, it, it's the same as flu, or, or so-and-so was right all along, or the, is, are just, uh, which have kind of just, descended really into puerile uh, name calling at some points, uh, really just it misunderstands the importance of the immunonaivety of the human population to SARS-CoV-2. There are more people who will be infected with SARS-CoV-2 in the 24 months or so that will represent the emergent phase of the SARS, of the COVID pandemic, than are infected in a flu season or even two flu seasons. It's because the human population is immunonaive to SARS-CoV-2. Now you may say, well, there's some you know, cross-reactivity with previous coronaviruses, that may be, but more people will become infected with COVID-19 in the 24 months of the emergent phase of the pandemic than are infected with flu in one or two flu seasons. So. This is a very serious health crisis that will kill a lot of people. It doesn't matter if the infection fatality rate is only two times higher than flu. It doesn't matter if the infection fatality rate is the same as flu. It is more dangerous. This is a more dangerous virus right now on planet Earth than flu. And that is uh, important. This is a very severe crisis and we need to treat it as such. Uh, now, the Great Barrington Declaration and the, uh, the position laid out by uh, my opponent is, is that we need to protect the vulnerable and let everyone else get on with society, therefore, thereby improving uh, their quality of life relative to adhering to public health orders. We need to follow what's proven to work. Protecting the vulnerable does not work. The Great Barrington Declaration does not go into any detail about how we will protect the vulnerable. And the fact of the matter is, it's a great idea on paper. I would be on the opposite side of this debate if it had any prospect of working. 
protecting the vulnerable hasn't worked in any country. And it will not work in the United States. It will not work in Western Europe. It does not work. Most ideas, it's a good idea, but most ideas fail. And this is failing. The world is full of great ideas that we're all familiar with because of survivorship bias. The good ideas persist. The failures are relegated to the slag heap of history. The only magic bullet tech solution that's gonna get us out of this pandemic is, is the vaccine. And thank goodness the vaccine is on the way. The fact that the vaccine is on the way and as we speak is being distributed is, is all the proof you need that we just need to adhere to these public health orders for a little bit while longer. There is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We will get through this. And there is no magic bullet. It's gonna take a lot of hard work and the vaccine to get us out of, uh, of the um, pandemic. The question is not, you know, is it a good idea to protect the vulnerable? It, it is in theory. But one of my favorite aphorisms is that in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. These ideas of protecting the vulnerable will not work in practice, in part because it is hard a priori to identify everyone who is vulnerable. Uh, it, it just, it's a great idea. It just, it's just, it's not working and it won't work in the real world. We need ideas that will work. 26% of all the COVID deaths in the county in which I live, which is the sixth most populous county in the United States, are among individuals younger than age 65. This is not exclusively a problem of older people. We cannot predict who will have a severe mortality uh, from COVID. The death rates in the United States among communities of color are double that among the white population. Uh, this is not just an age issue. This is a, a race and ethnicity issue and a class issue. And uh, it's not a question of uh, protecting uh, professional people, as, as my opponent said, and uh, hurting working class people. The non-adherence to lockdowns, well, I said I wasn't going to use that term, non-adherence to public health orders does as much damage to working class people as um, anything else in this pandemic. So let me give you an example. The Latino population of Orange County, California, where I live, is uh, highly in impacted, uh, disproportionately to their population. A, a lot of people in the Latino community in Orange County work in the service industry, where they have to come to restaurants and be uh, front of house staff in the restaurants, interacting with patrons who are unmasked. Uh, a patron spends 45 minutes in a restaurant, uh, a, a, a waiter or a waitress spends all day in the restaurant and then goes uh, home to a less affluent community at night. The, the, this exposure increases the risk of the working person. And uh, so we cannot always predict who the vulnerable are. 26% of the mortality where I live is among people less than 65. And it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, you, that, that's, represent, that's similar, it's re repeated similarly in communities across the United States and across the world. And we're talking about real excess mortality here. The United States will see 10% more deaths this year than we would have expected for 2020. And these are genuine deaths. This, this is not a reassortment of, uh, you know, people are dying of COVID who would have died of heart disease, which is an argument we hear all the time. These, this is, we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Deaths are increasing. What we really need is 
better fiscal policy to help those who are impacted. So uh, small business owners who own a restaurant, say, and people who work in the restaurant who are impacted by public health orders need to receive assistance to get them through this crisis. And this is something we've done before. We, we did more for fiscal uh, policy in the, in the aftermath of the 20, uh, 2008. Five minutes, five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And we did more in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis than we are doing now. And that is unconscionable. And if you look at the countries that have uh, been some of the brightest lights, like South Korea, the surveillance regime that the South Koreans have been following is positively draconian by American standards and is something that would not fly here. And so if, if we cannot do that kind of surveillance and it will not work, and again, we need ideas that will work not just on a piece of paper, but will work in the real world. Uh, given the lack of cooperation we're seeing with contact tracers in the United States, they, we can, I can assure you that the South Korean scenario will not work here. And so what we need is for us all to make temporary changes to our life, not going out to restaurants for a few more months. We can still order takeout. So someone else can still prepare our food if that's, that's our choice. And that is how we will get through this pandemic. The mortality that we're seeing uh, is substantial. It's, it's at all ages except for childhood ages. And the, my opponent today and, my, and, and people who share his views are very clear on what they perceive are the dangers of what they are characterizing as a lockdown. But very uh, evasive about the real mortality and real dangers that COVID-19 is uh, posing to us now. The postulates about uh, how scarred children will be from, from doing hybrid schooling or having to wear a mask at school are uh, absolutely hyperbolic and we do not know the future. And uh, I would say the children also benefit from having their grandparents around for a while. So, uh, we, you know, it's, we need to do what works. We gained 30 years of life expectancy in the United States in the 20th century by doing public health programs that worked. Uh, not by ch targeting only the um, those at risk, and that's what we need to do now. And uh, I'll have I'll have more to say, I guess, in the in the rebuttal stage. But I I, I just really want to summarize my central argument that protecting the vulnerable sounds great as a homily. It sounds like yes, of course. Why? You know, why aren't we doing this? But there, it's, it, it doesn't work in practice. We cannot predict who will, uh, who will die, who will get a severe case of COVID. There's so many examples of healthcare workers who are in their 20s and 30s who have died from COVID and uh, other people in that, those age groups who have died from COVID. And the, uh, the thousand times... Um, difference by age in COVID mortality rates is completely orthogonal. All mortality changes by a factor of a thousand over age. The point is that COVID risks for younger people are real and they are a real multiplier. One minute. Of, of the mortality that we normally see. This is the greatest public health crisis of in, in 100 years since the 1918 flu. And uh, it's certainly the worst pandemic of any uh, acute infectious disease that we've seen since the 1918 flu. And we need to act temporarily to get through this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, well, that concludes the initial
presentations. We now go to five minutes of rebuttal from each side. Uh, take it away, Martin, your five minutes of rebuttal. Uh, thank you. So uh, we agree that uh, COVID-19 is a very serious issue and a serious disease. Um, uh, so, so that is good. Uh, in terms of protection, in, in, in a pandemic, you can never protect anybody 100%. And uh, 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 there are a few people, not that many, who argue for zero COVID to try to sort of completely suppress it. Uh, but that's unrealistic and that would actually lead to more deaths. So uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot protect everybody 100%, no matter how low a risk, high risk they have. But we have shown actually that we have been able to protect the affluent uh, at the expense of the less affluent. For example, if you look at uh, a graph from Toronto, they saw that uh, the, uh, the, the cases went up equally in the high, uh, high affluent and less affluent neighborhoods. But then when you did the lockdown in Toronto on March 23, they diverged and the high affluent, the affluent neighborhoods sort of uh, went uh, straight and then down, while the less affluent neighborhood is went still up very high up and then had a big, big peak. So we have successfully protected the affluent members of society. And likewise, it is possible to protect uh, older people. We have failed to do so, certainly. So I agree with uh, uh, Andrew about that, but it is possible. And in the Great Barrington Declaration, we lay out a number of ways to do that, uh, both in the declaration itself, but then more details in the FAQ. Uh, for example, in nursing homes, which is the most vulnerable, we need to frequently test all the staff and we need to test all the visitors. Uh, there are still nursing homes where they do not test uh, the staff regularly. And to me, that's uh, a scandal. Uh, uh, we need to minimize staff rotation so that a resident in a nursing home are exposed to a few people as possible, and we should have not have any staff working in more than one nursing home. We still have nursing homes or nursing home staff who work in more than one nursing home, and that is also very dangerous. Uh, so there are, there are examples of countries who have done well protecting the nursing homes, for example, Norway. So it is possible if we want to do it and if we take the measures that are needed to do it. Uh, another thing that uh, we can protect, uh, when I go to the supermarket, I see older people there. And uh, it's important for older people to be outside and exercise and see, uh, see family and grandchildren and so on. But maybe a supermarket is not high on their, on their wish list of what they absolutely have to do. So we should uh, allow them to have uh, their groceries delivered to them. Uh, that's very important. Uh, and then, of course, when they do see other people, they should be able to have an in-home test that you don't have to go. You can just sort of uh, over-the-counter testing that you can do yourself. Uh, that can help uh, deciding uh, uh, testing when you have visitors. Also. Uh, Andrew talked about the takeout. Well, there are people in those restaurants who work as a chef who are, all, who are in the 60s, 60s and they're exposed to other people. So they are at risk to provi provide the takeout food that uh, we who are working at home can enjoy. So what we need to do is people are over 60, they should not have to work. Uh, if they can work from home, great. If they are a teacher, they should not be in school. They should work from home with online teaching or they can help other teachers with homework, grading homeworks or exams. Uh, and if that's not possible, we should let them take a few months of a sabbatical during the height of transmission, using, for example, disability insurance or social security as a temporary measure. Uh, that's very feasible to do and it's nothing we have tried. One minute, one minute. Uh, another example is uh, for protecting the elderly is we have taken college students who hang out, who normally would be at the university and sent them home to their parents, which are maybe in their 50s and 60s or even older. So by doing that, we are increasing the intergenerational mixing and that puts older people at risk. It's better if they are at the universities where they infect other people that are young in case they get infected. So there are many things that we could have done and that we still can do to protect the old high risk people. And now we soon have one more thing, which is the vaccine, which is another perfect tool for focus protection. 
in terms of two things. One is to vaccinate older people at high risk. And two, the second, uh, the another priority is to vaccinate caretakers of all people, nursing home staff and the hospital staff working with geriatric patients. So there certainly is many things that we could have done to protect the elderly that we didn't do. We wouldn't have protected them 100%, but we could have done a lot more better and saved many lives if we had used those uh, uh, public health uh, uh, public health orders. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Andrew, five minutes of rebuttal. Take it away, Andrew. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a number of points of uh, disagreement with my interlocutor, and I will do my best to fit them all into, into five minutes. Um, but uh, so, I mean, one of the things that uh, Martin said just now about seeing people at the supermarket uh, really emphasizes, uh, in fact, that the, my original point that calling what we are doing now a, a lockdown is really inappropriate. These are public health orders. And uh, here in California, even under my stay at home order, I, I can go for a walk anytime I want. I can go to uh, an essential business any anytime I want. I can go to the hardware store. I can go to the grocery store. Uh, you know, I can I can do lots of things. My individual freedoms aren't really um, curtailed. Now I know you're, uh, many people are probably thinking, well, that's because I don't work in a, in a movie theater and which has been you know shuttered or whatever. But uh, I mean, I mean that only speaks to uh, speaks to the point I think in which. Martin and I both agree that uh, that we need to use uh, fiscal policy to help make whole people who who are impacted. I mean, he said to use Social Security or or, or uh, other forms of uh, social insurance, but uh, that that is something that we haven't been doing, and it's uh, it's it's really uh, a, a pity that uh, that we haven't been using fiscal policy to help people get through this and we have an eviction crisis and, and, and so on. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, that would be perhaps an area of agreement between the two of us. But in, in, in any case, uh, it, uh, it, it just shows that, um, that, you know, we need to do more on that, on that side. Now, as far as uh, the public health orders uh, protecting the affluent, uh, I, I, I disagree. I mean, we, we know, I mean, those of us who study pandemics, we, we know that pandemics are inequality accelerators. And that is, you know, part of the, the reason why pandemics are so bad. But uh, th these health shocks at the population level uh, never affect rich and poor alike. And this pan uh, COVID pandemic is not affecting rich and poor alike. And to, to lay that at the feet of the public health orders is, is not fair. In fact, one of the things that I find so um, that I disagree with so much in the public discourse is that everything bad that's happening is laid at the feet of uh, the so-called lockdowns, and none of it is laid at the feet of you know the fact that we're in the worst pandemic in a hundred years. Um, you know the fact that there's uh, you know that there are demand shocks for certain services and goods uh, has as much to do with the pandemic as it does with uh, any public health orders. Uh, I, I agree that uh, long-term care facility uh, policy has been handled in, in many cases extremely poorly. And again, that is perhaps a, another point of agreement between Martin and I. But we're, we're almost a year into this pandemic in, in the United States and, and Europe. And if, if we haven't found the, um, you know, the special sauce to keep uh, nursing homes protected by now. Uh, I don't understand how we can assume that, uh, um, you know, uh, that we're just going to do that o o overnight. I mean, I mean, I mean the, um, you know, the idea is we're just going to hyper protect uh, the vulnerable, who, as I've said several times, we cannot predict who, who they all are and include uh, many younger people. But uh, the idea that we're going to replace uh, public health orders with the, with the targeted um, protection of long-term care facilities. I mean, long-term care facilities protection is uh, part of public health orders now, but it's just not uh, working very well. And it's, uh, it's because things, as I've said, don't always go to plan. And it's, it's going to go, yeah. yeah, go even worse to plan 
if we adopt the Great Barrington Declaration as our governing principle of, uh, of, uh, of how we move forward. The, the opponents of public health orders are very certain that everything that's bad is due to the public health orders and none of it is due to the pandemic and typically very dismissive of the real risks that the pandemic causes and uh, focusing on the infection fatality rate when, as I said, that is not the most important statistic. It's the immune naive nature of the population. So there's just, um, I mean, I have so many fundamental differences with the Great Barrington Declaration and uh, we will get through this and we need to keep protecting everyone in society because we are all stakeholders in a society. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, that concludes the, uh, uh, the initial presentation and rebuttal portion of the evening. We now go to the Q&A portion and uh, uh, let me just reset. And uh, uh, I've got a couple of questions coming in for you, Andrew. Maybe I could ask them. Well, let me focus on this one. Uh, uh, the, it begins with a statement that, uh, citing data, uh, that 94% of those people who die of COVID-19 have an underlying condition, have a comorbidity. And so uh, wouldn't that be an identifier of the vulnerable? And the, so if you do have a comorbidity, you are vulnerable because 94% of those who die of COVID are vulnerable in terms of a comorbidity. And since you uh, endorse uh, Martin Kaldor's idea of social security, of, of fiscal policy helping people, wouldn't that be a marker uh, in order to protect the vulnerable? Uh, that's a great question. As, as is so often the case in, in, in this, um, debate and in the larger public discourse around COVID-19, there are statements made which don't have uh, any kind of comparison group. Death certificates have uh, an underlying cause and they have uh, many entries for contributory causes. You can have 15 or more contributory causes on a death certificate it's not, and it's not uncommon to see multiple causes of death with, with one being nominated as the underlying cause. And so comorbidities are a fact of life. They're a fact of life in, in, in normal, pre-pandemic and life, they will be effective life in post-pandemic life. So the fact that there are comorbidities in COVID really doesn't differentiate it from other causes of death. And moreover, um, the comorbidities that have often been cited as um, being really salient, for example, diabetes and hypertension and obesity are, you know, co things that people live with for decades. I mean, hypertension is, is very uh, often in many cases in most cases, well managed by uh, modern uh, therapies, and uh, you, you know, uh, obesity does not shave uh, thirty years off of life expectancy. So, uh, so we're, the people who die are are dying with comorbidities that that you know that they could live with for for decades. So, uh, th it's really the COVID that is the issue, and and uh, I I don't foresee um, using data on people who've died so far to protect those who are still living as a viable option. I'm sorry, well, okay, the focus, not a viable option, but then uh, the question is like, why isn't, you said that it's, it's impossible to identify the vulnerable. So the focus here is the, the objective identifier of the vulnerable would be to say that if you have a comorbidity, you are vulnerable. So wouldn't that be a reasonably objective identifier of the vulnerable, given that you said we can't identify the vulnerable, but can't we, since 94% of them have comorbidities? Wouldn't that be the focus of the question? And, I mean, what percentage of the U.S. population has has some sort of comorbidity? I mean, these things are all uh, always obvious after the fact, but uh, I mean, obesity and hypertension are extremely prevalent, uh, as is uh, type two diabetes. So, uh, ag again, uh, it sounds great, but it's it's not practical in my opinion. Martin, you want to address that question uh, as well? Yes. So there are comorbidities that increase this risk of. Uh, uh, COVID-19 mortality, uh, but age is by far the biggest risk factor. Uh, it's an enormous difference in risk, as I said, more than 1,004 between the oldest and the youngest. 
So anybody who is uh, above 60 should consider themselves to be uh, in a high risk group. And of course, if you're older than that, even more so. But uh, uh, if you have comorbidities like Andrew was saying, for example, diabetes or obesity, that also increases your risk. And I don't know the exact thing, but I think uh, having those type of comorbidities is, is equivalent to about five years in age. So if you're in your 50s and you have diabetes or you're obese, I think you should also be very, very careful. Okay, uh, another question for you, Andrew, uh, relating to uh, the argument that Martin was making with respect to the schools, uh, arguing, uh, citing data that zero deaths occurred in Sweden and then stipulating that, uh, that vulnerable teachers who uh, might be exempted, but a uh, question, would you lift uh, the public health measures, as you call them, with respect to the schools? So, uh, first of all, I, I don't expect any uh, childhood deaths in, 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 in a country as small as Sweden uh, for reasons that we have both talked about. I mean, the COVID-19 is unlike flu in that it doesn't kill children. I mean, and that's just, that's why you have no deaths in Sweden uh, from kids because uh, it, it, the death rates are extremely low. Uh, Ex extremely, extremely, extremely low for children from COVID-19. I mean, that's an area where I think Martin and I probably agree the most. I think uh, schools, uh, you know, but Sweden, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to make this, uh, you know, uh, about Sweden um, necessarily, but, uh, you know, Sweden has done worse than its neighbors, Norway and Finland, for example. So, I mean, I don't, I don't see, you know, why we need to uh, keep sort of fetishizing Sweden in, in the in the debate, um, but the uh, the question about schools is a good one, and I understand and, and I know that pe people in the audience have uh, very strong opinions about schools. Uh, you know, I think schools can carefully uh, continue to be uh, running in person, and uh, certainly more primary schools than high schools, and. Uh, high schools need to be watched very carefully, and it, we're you know we're debating public health orders, or, or if you insist on calling them you know lockdowns, then fine. But uh, the and I don't uh, so we're, this is not a debate about schools exclusively, and I, I don't want to see bars and nightclubs open and schools closed. That is absolutely perverse. I want to see uh, bars and nightclubs and re restaurants for in-person dining. Uh, Close before we, we close schools. Uh, in some circumstances, it, you know, some communities have seen fit to include uh, distance learning, uh, you know, for for uh, for kids. And uh, you know, it's 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 probably a very uh, worthy debate to have as to how effective, you know, if you're in the second grade, how effective Zoom instruction is. And it's not something that anyone wants to see. I I do think that. Uh, you know, the, rem the remedies, uh, you know, we may have to experiment with uh, doing a 13th year of uh, primary and secondary education for some cohorts to make up for uh, this disruption, which again is a disruption caused as much by the pandemic as it is by any public health order. And also, you know, uh, we're extrapolating from uh, studies in the past of kids who have uh, missed a year of education or something like that, where, where everyone around them has had that year of education. And then we're saying, see, well, look, how terrible it is, if, you know, and look at your future job market outcomes if you, if you lose out on education. But when an, an entire cohort has the same effect, you know, there are ways we can remedy it such that uh, the comparative disadvantage will be, will be lessened. So, I mean, th there's all sorts of doom and gloom extrapolation from very limited data about, you know, the scarring that these uh, children will, will impact, will have. And I, I, I believe we're, uh, the other side is being overconfident in uh, predicting the future 30 years from now in terms of the outcomes of these, these children. Well, okay, but if I did hear you correctly, you seem to indicate that you would uh, rescind the public health orders that have shut down or partially shut down the schools, at least up to perhaps the, uh, uh, up, to the up to the high school level. Uh, is that right? You would, you um, would rescind that? I, I mean, on, only if everything else is, uh, hasn't already been tried. I mean, I don't, I don't want to see schools, uh, schools closed, but, not, uh, but uh, bars and nightclubs open. But I, I th so I mean, I, I think in many cases, schools can remain open, at least for elementary, but 
to me, it's not uh, beyond scope to allow certain jurisdictions to say that we're going to do uh, Zoom education, you know, uh, for for schools at least uh, temporarily. But it, I mean, it needs to be approached on a case by case basis. I, schools are the most important, you know, in, in social institution in society and they should be closed last and opened first. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, do you want to comment on that question and uh, Andrew's response? Uh, right. Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, in focus protection, uh, the two things that in my view is the most important, if I could only pick two things, one is to open all the schools for in-person teaching. And they open in some parts of the country, but there are many kids who are not getting uh, in-person teaching. And uh, that is of course affecting the working class the most, working class children the most, because uh, children of, of uh, more affluent parents, uh, they can arrange a tutor or post-schooling or some, I, I know some people have sent their uh, kids to private school when the public schools closed. So uh, this is something that's very tragic for working class children especially, but of course for all children as well. So I'm very happy to hear that Andrew is also sort of prioritizing uh, keeping schools open for in-person teaching. Uh, the other priority of the Great Barrington Declaration is to do a better job with uh, uh, nursing home residents since they are the most uh, vulnerable. So I also very much appreciate that Andrew uh, acknowledges that we have not done as good a job as we could with that and that we need to do a better job. So, uh, so there are certainly uh, is, uh, areas of agreement between uh, me and Andrew, so I think that's very nice. Uh, okay, uh, now question for uh, you, Martin, uh, having to do with Andrew's statement about uh, people being immune, immuno-naive, uh, which um, uh, is interpreted to mean then that uh, the idea of herd immunity the idea that uh, we we have in any in men, in some cases or could in many cases achieve herd immunity where fifty percent of the population are immune. Uh, Mar uh, Andrew seems to be saying that that's not really achievable. Uh, and so this is of course a, a an issue of your different scientific perceptions. Immuno naivete. We're immuno naive. Uh, that's what he says. And could you? respond uh, to that statement on Andrew's part? Well, he is correct that, that, is, uh, that uh, this is a new virus of which uh, many people do not have uh, immunity. Uh, for some reason, children seem to be handling it very well. And uh, there's probably some cross immunity from other coronaviruses and that's probably what's explaining the low mortality in Japan, for example, what could be one of the reasons there. Uh, but I mean, the risk, we are naive to this and that's why it's a pandemic. Uh, so, and I agree with him that the uh, infection fatality ratio is not uh, the only thing that we need to compare because it's also the number of people who actually get infected. Uh, that's a key issue in terms of how serious it is. So on those sort of uh, epidemiological things, there's complete agreement, I think, between us. Well, you have mentioned uh, uh, in the uh, Great Banking Declaration herd immunity. Are you basically saying then that uh, herd immunity is not likely in this case? Uh, no, I mean, uh, on, the, on the contrary, we will reach herd immunity whatever strategy we use. So whether we do lockdowns or focus protections or whatever we do, we will eventually reach herd immunity uh, because that's a scientific established phenomena just like gravity is in uh, physics. So uh, it's like if you're in an airplane, if you're in an airplane, you will, uh, uh, gravity will eventually assure that you do hit the ground, uh, no matter what you do, how you fly the airplane. So the key thing is how do we minimize mortality until we reach herd immunity? And herd immunity can be reached through either natural infection or from vaccines, or what's gonna happen for COVID-19 with the combination of the two. And uh, well, that, cause that actually gives rise to the other question. Uh, Andrew has said, we do have the vaccines uh, developed. They are being delivered. Uh, would you uh, then say that uh, logically then we should wait for the vaccines uh, 
to be uh, dispensed so that we can achieve herd immunity and then continue the, uh, the public health orders that he favors. Should we do that and wait for their vaccines to bring herd immunity? So when we have a vaccine now, uh, we still don't know uh, very much about it, uh, but we know that it reduces uh, uh, symptoms in, uh, in, in adults uh, up to uh, about age 70 or so. We don't know how it affects mortality. We don't know how it affects transmission yet. Uh, but uh, what we need to do with the vaccine is to use it as a tool for focus protection uh, to vaccinate uh, people in nursing homes, for example, that's the top priority, uh, to vaccinate geriatric patients in hospitals, uh, also to vaccinate uh, the older population in general, uh, uh, as well as, which is also important, to vaccinate uh, uh, staff members, uh, staff at nursing homes, uh, and uh, uh, people working in hospitals who are taking care of old people there. So we can use vaccines as one additional tool in doing focus protection, but uh, we should not only rely on that. We have to continue. We have to still do a better job uh, testing nursing home staff, for example. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely no reason to keep school closed, wait, closed, uh, waiting for for the vaccine. Uh, and with the vaccine coming, that's just uh, one more argument, I think, for opening all schools for in-person teaching. Um, Andrew, uh, do you want to comment then on those questions and on uh, uh, Martin's yes. response? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let me make two, two quick points. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gene. Uh, first of all, the 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 point I made about immune naivete. Uh, it's basically in service of the idea that we shouldn't worship the IFR, the infection fatality rate, being relatively low. Uh, that's not what's important about COVID. Uh, but we're immunonaive at the start of the pandemic, but we won't be immunonaive at the end of the pandemic. So when I use this term immunonaive, I don't mean to imply that herd immunity is impossible. Indeed, uh, as, as Martin said, herd immunity is the outcome, uh, no, no, no matter what. I mean, the end game it is, I think we both agree, it's herd immunity. I think we're, we're, we're debating uh, uh, how we get there. And Martin and I have, uh, have quite different uh, visions of how uh, the road looks from here to herd immunity. But herd immunity is the outcome. My comments about immune naivety were to sort of discount this uh, continual drumbeat of uh, the IFR. Now, let me make one other quick point. Uh, the vaccine is the piece of tech that's most important here. And I'm certainly looking forward to getting my vaccination. And uh, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm low down the list because uh, people like nursing home staff uh, should be prioritized. And I agree 100% there with Martin. But uh, we still don't, and I hate to be sort of uh, a little bit glass half empty all the time, but we, we still don't know um, if this is a transmission blocking vaccine or or simply if it reduces uh, symptoms. So we know that the vaccine is gonna do us a lot of good and it's gonna drop mortality down, but we, we're not 100% sure yet whether people who are vaccinated, whether, whether they are absolutely steril, have sterilizing immunity and are, are completely invulnerable to infection, or if they simply get a, a much, 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 much milder case of COVID when they are exposed to, to the virus. And, and therefore there's still a possibility that they can shed virus. So vaccinating a nursing home staff member, while, while certainly appropriate, uh, does not mean that that nursing home staff mem member doesn't still need to mask when uh, she is on duty at the nursing home uh, because we're not 100% sure that she cannot shed virus uh, asymptomatically, even post-vaccination. And this is, ex is exactly why we need to keep up the public health orders so, to, so as to reduce the community transmission so that uh, even a vaccinated nursing home staff member doesn't acquire um, infection going to the movie theater or, or, or something like that uh, until it's safe to do so because uh, the, this vaccine could render infections to be asymptomatic rather than preventing them entirely, but that doesn't uh, entirely reduce the transmission to zero. So it, there's a lot of tricky nuance here, but I, I do agree with Martin that uh, in the, as we come up with priorities of who gets vaccine first, that a nursing home staff member should be high up the list. Uh, 
getting a number of questions about the public health measures, um, Andrew. I guess one in particular is where is your end game? At what point, uh, given that you even seem to be expressing doubts about the vaccine, at what point would you lift the public health uh, measures that you favor? What, what has to happen before you say, let's end it? And how many months is that going to likely to take? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, my vision for these public health orders is that they're temporary. And, uh, you know, uh, over the summer, we saw uh, transmission go down in many locale, locales that had had a spring wave. And the, the key is to get the, trans, uh, the, the effective reproductive number well below one. And that means you know, that each case on average is producing less than one new case. And we're not gonna eradicate COVID. I mean, there's all sorts of pie in the sky stuff about COVID zero. And uh, I mean, COVID is most likely gonna become an another seasonal like flu-like illness that kind of is just sort of in the, in the background. We, we have uh, four coronavirus strains that uh, circulate uh, worldwide now that caused the common cold in the wintertime. And this will likely in, in years or decades become like the fifth such syndrome that it'll just be, it'll be there. We're, the genie's out of the bottle on COVID. We're not gonna eradicate it. Uh, I mean, my anticipation with the, between the vaccine and seasonal effects and people you know, get, getting to herd immunity the hard way, my anticipation would be that summer of 2021 in the Northern hemisphere will be essentially a normal summer. Uh, in terms of restrictions, but uh, the answer is when cases come down and, and the effective reproductive number is significantly below one, then we can start to, to lift public health orders. It's certainly not nothing, nothing that I envision us doing uh, indefinitely and, and not because I expect us to eradicate COVID. I, I, I just think you know, we're in the emergent phase now and this is the first winter in which the Northern hemisphere starts the winter with COVID on the ground. And, and therefore, even though people are already exhausted from all of this, it's really still early days. Um, hmm. uh, comment from you, Martin, on that? Uh, yeah, Andrew's correct that uh, uh, this virus is going to become endemic. But uh, the nature of it is actually quite promising for the future because uh, what's, what happens is when you have an endemic, you get new people are born. And of course, they don't have immunity, uh, and then they will be exposed. But they will be exposed as children, uh, and for children, this is not a serious uh, uh, virus. So it's going to be with us for many decades. But most people are going to be exposed uh, when they are children, and then they're going to build up the immunity. So I think the long-term uh, prospects uh, of this disease is actually quite favorable. Uh, that and when I first heard about. Uh, uh, about uh, COVID uh, in Wuhan, I sort of quickly uh, tried to uh, uh, figure out about it, and it was uh, it was uh, it was immediately obvious that this was going to be a pandemic that's going to tour the whole world. That it was impossible to keep it out uh, from uh, from uh, sort of uh, hitting most parts of the world. At the same time, uh, as a parent, you're always mostly concerned about your children, and I have three kids, ages five, five, and eighteen. And uh, uh, after being worried about 10 minutes, I could clearly see that this is not a dangerous thing for children, so my children will be fine. Thank you. Uh, question for you, Andrew, uh, and uh, from Martin as well, but let's start with you, Andrew. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the questions have to do with toning up on one side of the ledger, those who likely have been, have died from uh, the public health measures. And uh, the focus of many is that uh, the unseen, especially, is that because of recessions in the rich countries of the world, a lot of people are starving in the poor countries. So there's an enormous amount of death uh, attributable to that, to the recessions that the, that the uh, public health measures have caused. And uh, so that seems to be a big number, uh, as many argue, and then, uh, and then you, you speak of all the deaths that have occurred, even though we've had public health orders. 
So then you have to presumably focus on the deaths that have been prevented because of the public health orders. And I guess further, so many other questions are, what evidence do you have that the public health orders have made much a difference? Much of a difference when we have such so much, so many different public health orders in different states, and difficulty showing any difference in deaths. So that's a long question, but the the, the short version of it is: um, how many how many lives have been saved by the public health orders, and how many, in your view, including looking globally uh, in the in the poor countries of the world, how many lives have been lost? Well, this is a very multidimensional question, and uh, but I mean, the, if we look at the mortality in the United States, I'll, I'll get to the world in in a, in a minute. But if we look at the mortality in the United States, uh, I mean, if you look at the excess deaths in the United States in uh, with a painting with a broad brush stroke here uh, in 2020, you know, the deaths that are over and beyond what we would ex expect at this stage in the year, based on you know the pretty regular patterns of mortality in previous years. Uh, the number of deaths we've had, uh, about 300,000, you know, maps pretty well onto uh, the, 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 the excess deaths. So the, the deaths that have been counted as COVID deaths, because it's a good faith determination of, of a healthcare provider that this person died of COVID, are, are mapping pretty well onto, I mean, not perfectly, but pretty well onto the, the excess deaths that we've seen. And so, I mean, I, 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 th I think that the, this, this idea that I'm, I'm confident, in fact, that this idea that that public health measures are causing other other deaths is is going to be uh, shown to be min minimal in its effect, and it's and it's not just public health orders that cause deaths. It's pan it's it's the pandemic. I mean, I mean, hospitals in Orange County are over where I live are overflowing with COVID patients right now, and the director of EMS of the County has advised hospitals to postpone elective surgeries. That is not because of the public health orders. That is because of the pandemic. And it's true that in the absence of a vaccine, if we just run the clock for 25 years with COVID, you know, sooner or later, everyone will, 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 will get it. And uh, the idea of these interventions is to flat, to flatten the curve so that we don't crush the hospitals at any given point in time. But the area under that curve, whether it's steep or whether it's flat, is 100% of the population or 70% or, or of the population or whatever. But we, we've seen, for example, in the Dakotas, where uh, the government took a very light touch to, to, to interventions. We see the highest... Um, infection rates and very high uh, mortality rates compared to other states that have been more proactive. So, and given that the uh, vaccine is on our doorstep, um, you, you know, it, it really makes all the more sense just to steal ourselves for a few more months of adherence to orders, and then we can start to, you know, get mortality under control. As far as uh, children starving to death in developing countries, I mean, uh, that's a very uh, stark, uh, that paints a very stark picture, but uh, the reality on the ground is much more complicated than that. I mean, when, when you look at mortality statistics uh, in many countries are still uh, a lot of guesswork and uh, there's, uh, I mean, people in my profession of demography spend a lot of time trying to estimate mortality statistics from different regions. I, I truly believe that, that these accounts will be shown to be exaggerations. Uh, and I haven't seen anything reliable that suggests that there's wholesale famine mortality in the developing world at the moment, much less caused by uh, COVID-19 recessions in uh, North America and Europe. Uh, just let me uh, rephrase that question just briefly that that uh, with respect to uh, the lives saved from the protective health measures, uh, you cite all the deaths that have occurred and yet we've had protective health uh, orders. So uh, do you think that a substantial, do you think that, you know, Florida has been contrasted, Florida doesn't have a whole lot of protective health measures, has a lot of old people who are vulnerable, uh, South Dakota. Do you think that there's overwhelming evidence that hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved 
from the protective health orders? That, oh, not that hundreds. Would that triple, double the number of deaths if we did not have the public health orders? Well, first of all, hundreds of thousands of lives, no. But second of all, uh, the, the United States has been absolutely abysmal in adherence to, to these public health orders. I mean, uh, there, there's a public health order uh, here in California, and uh, a number of restaurants have, have been just openly said that they're going to uh, defy these orders. And uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, uh, so it, it's, it's very hard to quantify um, that, you know, in the middle of things, what the, uh, the impact is of public health orders, especially since the, the most important mortality statistics are going to be the final mortality statistics. So I will concede that we are um, in a crisis and that it's hard to measure these outcomes as the crisis unfolds. Uh, because some countries, for example, shifting for the moment to, Northern, to, to Europe, some countries that did well early on have been hammered later on. And so we need to, uh, you know, my, I'm appealing to, to principles re re really rather than statistics in terms of, uh, you know, doing what we know works for controlling infection spread and not uh, pursuing an ideal of, uh, of targeted protection, which I have asserted you know, does not work and will not work. And it Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, Martin, uh, would you, hopefully you'll agree that uh, since we have actually run out of uh, normally a lot of time for the Q&A, uh, you have seven and a half minutes of your summary. And so if you want to comment on what, uh, what Andrew has just said in your summary, please do so. But let's, uh, let's go to the summary portion of the evening. Uh, seven and a half minutes for you, Martin, to sum up your case. Please take it away, Martin. Uh, thank you. So uh, I guess one disagreement that we do have, which is big, is uh, the collateral damage on uh, uh, other health aspects, uh, which uh, I think is uh, enormous. Uh, we don't have all the statistics in because we have very good statistics or very sort of uh, up-to-date daily, weekly statistics on COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, mortality, and so on. But a lot of these other the collateral damage on cardiovascular health, cancers, uh, mental health, uh, and so on, is things that we know a little bit about, but, uh, 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 but something that we will learn more and more about as, as time goes. But we do already know a lot about it now. And uh, there is a website that's very, that, that has many of these uh, scientific studies on this. It's called uh, Collateral Global. So, uh, collateralglobal.org, uh, where you can uh, see about effects on starvation, which one study thought it was 10,000 children starving to death in the world every month. Uh, and that means that there's also many who are malnutritionists, which will have long-term public health effects. Uh, tuberculosis has gone up, the polio is, is worse, and so on. Uh, so there's enormous uh, uh, damage from, uh, from the lockdowns, uh, and uh, from, uh, from people being afraid to go to the doctor and so on. Uh, now, the Great Barrington Declaration and focus protection is nothing something that is uh, novel or fringe. Uh, it's in accordance with the many pandemic preparedness plans that countries have made up that in the pandemic, you focus your attention on protecting those at high risk. Uh, it's also something that's not unique to the three of us who wrote it. Uh, there are many people who, uh, including the three of us, but many others who back in uh, March and April was arguing for uh, a focused protection using different names, age targeted strategy, et cetera, a risk-based strategy. Uh, so this is nothing novel. And uh, there were, uh, so, so many people were advocating for that uh, very early on. But the reason you don't necessarily realize that is that as we were doing that, we were uh, uh, we were not sort of in the media. Uh, uh, I tried to publish my thoughts in the U.S., but failed to do so. I had no problems uh, publishing in my native Sweden in the major daily newspapers there, but I was unable to publish anything in March, April in the United States, uh, despite several attempts. Uh, so. Uh, I think this has been a very good and informative uh, discussion. 
I think uh, I agree with uh, Andrew Neumer that this kind of uh, uh, scientific discourse is critical and I'm uh, also willing to die uh, on for it on the same hill as Andrew is doing. Uh, I'd like to thank Eugene and everybody at Soho Forum for organizing this. Most of all though, I would like to thank Andrew for, for doing this debate and this discussion uh, and for doing it in such a, 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 a logical, scientific and polite manner. Uh, uh, but most of all for him being willing to do so. I, uh, I did another debate about a month ago, a monk debate, and they were unable to get uh, any epiologist to debate me. So they found a psychologist instead. So that was a good debate. But uh, I really, really appreciate uh, uh, Andrew for doing this. So thank you so much, Andrew. All right. We, is that, and that concludes your summary. Nothing further? Yes, that's good. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, Andrew, you, uh, you can take your seven and a half minutes to summarize. Uh, take it away, Andrew. Thank you, Gene, and th thank you, Martin. Um, my pleasure to debate you. I'll debate you again, if you'd like, uh, as the uh, pandemic continues to unfold. And uh, thanks also, as I said, to the audience. And uh, it's so important that we maintain channels of scholarly debate because there will be disagreements. Uh, there are differences of opinions among uh, people who can reasonably uh, claim expertise in, in the area. And, um, you know, I, I hope I, I've made my case to the audience. The, uh, we're in the midst of the greatest infectious disease pandemic of an acute illness in over 100 years. And we are all stakeholders in our communities, in our national societies, and in the human population world society. And the way we are going to defeat this pandemic is together. It is impossible to target certain people for protection and to pull it off. It's a great idea, but there are plenty of great ideas that just don't work. Nothing succeeds like success, the historian E.H. Carr said. And the, you, the world is full of ideas that we still have because they su were successful. This idea of targeted protection will not be successful. It will be an abject failure. And, uh, you know, it, to the extent to which the United States is undergoing, um, you know, really painful throes of this pandemic right now is reflected uh, because it's a, it's a terrible pandemic and because we're not really adhering to public health orders. Uh, I, I agree that um, we, sh we should find a solution so that a 60 or year old person or older uh, can have someone to do their shopping uh, for them. Uh, and, and my interlocutor said that the, he sees people sh uh, in the grocery store who are elderly doing their own grocery shopping. But, you know, we're not funding the fiscal you know, we're not funding programs that would, that would make that happen. And in absence of that, we need to just lower the temperature of the pandemic. We need to lower the effective reproductive number by all contributing to these public health orders. It's, it's an evidence that the public health orders aren't being followed, that we can all just go to the supermarket whenever we, we want, and there's no controls of the number of people who are admitted in, in, in most cases, at any given point in time. Uh, so. You know, it's, it's, I, I know people are tired of everything. And, but what they're tired of is the pandemic, not the public health orders. And, you know, the other, the other thing I want to say is that we, we cannot take everything bad about the pandemic and lay it all at the feet of public health orders and none of it at the feet of uh, the pandemic itself. That is so intellectually dishonest to me. We are in a, a really grave pandemic and, you know, the public health orders are not ex exacerbating pandemic mortality and, and I seriously doubt they're exacerbating non-pandemic mortality in significant ways. In, the net benefit is, is, is enormous in terms of cutting down on COVID-19 mortality in the community and, uh, 
you know, right now where I live, we're experiencing a surge, a hospital surge, both in hospital occupancy and in the ICU. And this is caused by the pandemic. This is people in the hospital with COVID-19. This is caused by the pandemic. Now, if someone cannot receive care for a stroke or a heart attack because the ICUs are full in Orange County, and they are, how is that a result of the lockdown? That is a result of the pandemic. We are facing a crisis. That crisis is COVID-19. We need to do what's proven. It's, it's a great homily to say we're going to protect the vulnerable, but the vulnerable includes far, far more people than just the elderly. It includes communities of color, and it, and it includes other people whom we cannot always predict. 26% of the deaths in where I live are among people younger than age 65. So I, I thank, uh, again, Martin, you, and, and everyone who organized this debate, and I thank the audience for making this debate happen. I hope um, I've changed your mind. Um, and we will all get through this, and we will get through it using the public health techniques that expanded life expectancy by 30 years since the 20th century. And those are tech public health approaches that aim to help everyone, not just a few people. Those are the ones that work best. Those are the ones that are proven. And those are the ones that will succeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so that concludes uh, the debate. Uh, Jane, please open the final vote. We have uh, the results. And uh, this is, oh my gosh, wow. All right, I, I'm going to deliver uh, the, uh, the punchline. The punchline is that according to Oxford style voting, it was a tie. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, although I'll send you guys the numbers, since of course it's part of the game, it's kind of funny. Uh, the yes vote on Martin's behalf uh, began at 68.06% and went up. It gained 5.56% points, went to 73.61. Uh, but you are rated on how much you move the needle. So Martin got an overwhelming majority. However, he went up by 5.56%. Uh, the no vote began at 19.44 and went up to 25. It too gained 5.56 points. So it was an even split. And I guess you guys are gonna to have to split the Tootsie Roll. Uh, congratulations to you both. And thanks so much for participating. And uh, see you all hopefully for our next debate. Good evening all.